back again. This is episode 7 of Quantum Bible, and we're now at this part. It starts 476, which is when Otto Wacker overthrew the last guy, Romulus Augustus, who's right here. Where's Romulus? Oh, I might. Yeah, there he is. Okay. He died after 476, but he was deposed in September. It's going to be real important to go into the month in this increment. He was deposed in September by Odewacker. So the question is, okay, what happened? Why didn't the East do something? Well, first of all, we got Antidemius dying. Antidemius dying in 472 right here. Leo, who was in the East. Anitamius was his, like, um, related because um, his son married Leo's daughter. Okay? I don't know what kind of relationship you call that between these two. And Leo was, at you know, Emperor of Byzantine. He dies right here. So when Anne and Damius dies in the West, there's a power vacuum and a lot of jockeying around musical chairs. Leo, for his part, was not feeling real well. He ends up dying of dysentery or possibly some other kind of ailment two years later. So he's not really well enough to do a, a lot about it. Plus, he didn't actually want to do a lot about it, but they tried. Not very hard mainly because Leo was always facing some kind of opposition himself. Not a lot, but some. And his own wife was kind of trying to instigate things, too. So, when he dies right here, the next two years, 475, 476, when Rome actually falls because Odovacar takes it over, they weren't, the people in the East were not really doing a whole lot because they were busy fighting over dynast, dynastic succession. So they really didn't bother a whole lot about the same dynastic succession arguments that were going on here. They tried to do a few things, but not enough. Okay, so Leo finally dies right here. And that dynastic succession uh, fighting that was going on at the lower levels, remember? This is setting the tone. Seven heads and ten horns. Okay, head means like you've got authority. Horn means you got power. So you can have authority and power or just power or you can have just authority but no power. Alright? That's why I said, you know, don't don't focus on who are the seven and who are the ten. First of all, you're not going to know for the real tribulation. Secondly, and actually more importantly he, he's giving you a paradigm of history here so learn the idea the idea is that when Christians are busy fighting with each other see Haimatos, Haimatos means blood when they're busy having their little civil wars with each other then the whole world goes to hell in a handbasket and instead of, instead of anybody doing anything everybody's just standing around like John talking about himself here he's just standing there looking shocked and we're all busy wringing our hands over all these things that are happening meanwhile that provokes a sort of civil war amongst those who aren't Christians who are usually in power okay here's the thing for power here's the thing for authority and so there as it were it's contagious when we fight amongst ourselves, it's contagious to those who aren't Christians. Alright? And so they're fighting with each other. And that's really why we got what we got going on in the U.S. right now. Okay? Seriously. It's the same thing happening now. That's why I'm stressing, don't worry about who the seven are or who the ten are. Learn the bigger lesson about the fact of them. And that fact of them permeates what happens in here. And especially at this point, when there's nobody heading. 75, 76. What's going on in the West is musical chairs who's going to be emperor next. And one guy gets it, and then he gets the pose, and another guy gets it, and he gets the pose. 
Well, the same thing is happening in the East. So we have another power vacuum. And it's really fascinating that God uses this word to describe it. Hupo means under. Truncated to hoop here. Ago, here's age, third person, singular, means to lead. And when you combine the preposition hupo with the ago meaning to lead, you get someone leading somebody else. Okay? This is famously used for Christ in, I want to say it's Isaiah 53, 9. He's led away. It's also used very significantly by John. I want to say that's in 2 John. It's also used about Peter. How Peter's going to be led away as a signification of how he's going to end his life at the end of 2 Peter. Or it's in 2 Peter. I don't know if it's at the end of 2 Peter. It might be at the beginning. So to be led away by somebody else. Okay? Here led to destruction into ice, ace, that's how I should pronounce it, apolean, destruction, uh, accusative case, hupage, somebody else, it's single, third person, whoever it is, doing the leading, okay? In the tribulation, it means that God is, that, that what this beast is going to be, is le going to lead to his own destruction, and he's going to be led away himself, of course, by God, bound and fettered, thrown into the lake of fire. Okay? That's at the very end of history. Now, so it's making a play on that because all of this stuff I just said is already in scripture by the time John writes this. Okay? So he these words have a pregnant meaning to the reader. All right? So what happens when one thing is led to destruction? Well, there's a kind of chaos because if you don't have a, a stable who's going to come next succession, then there's a sort of chaos where everybody's trying to be the successor. And that's what happens here. Right in here. Age. Who's going to lead? You see the cleverness of this? You have to know the etymology of the word hupago in order to get the joke. Hoop means under. Okay, well now both this guy and this guy are under. Six feet under to be specific. And who's now going to lead? That's the battle that's going on during the very during the very time the word lead is outlined in black for two years. Finally, at the end of those two years, specifically in September, Odovacher comes and says to Romulus Augustus, "Hi, you don't exist anymore." However, in that same year, there was another guy who rose in the east due to the game of musical chairs, a guy named Zeno. Now, technically speaking, as soon as Leo died, or very, very close to that, there's a little bit of an argument that goes on over who's to rule next. But it's basically his son, because he's married into the family, but his son gets sick, and there's a lot of problem there. But it's like almost, you know, the same year, Zeno comes to take over for his son. Technically, but and this is this is the point about seven heads and ten horns, and all those marital alliances that started, you know, with Pulcheria being the granddaughter of Theodosius the first, and Martian, and then Gallia Placida who is related to Honorius, being the mother of Valentinian III, and all their advisors, and there's all this cross-marrying between the advisors and, and relatives of the royal family, the imperial family. That's where you're getting the seven heads and ten horns, and they're all fighting with each other because by marriage, or by blood, or by some other connection, they're all related to the imperial family for succession. Poor Zeno ends up being, as it were, a, a sort of apogee of that. And there's so many people who he ends up being related to by one means or another, and they think they deserve the crown instead of him. So yeah, his, his son comes to power, but it doesn't last. And then he takes the power over his son, but there's all these other relatives 
or advisors who have married into the family or some kind of claim or another kind of claim. So this poor guy from 476 when he find, when when he sort of consolidates his power over his internal relatives for a little while um when he comes to power that is in August okay in September because of all that wrangling it's a month later okay it could have been at the very beginning of the month I, they don't tell me when in September Romulus is deposed by Odovacher so Odovacher is officially running the Western Roman Emperor Empire at the time Zeno finally consolidates his power versus his own um, family and other members who are contesting him okay including Leo the first wife and that keeps on going for the balance of his reign, actually. But it's off again, on again, all right? So on the one hand, it really is the Eastern Empire's fault that the West falls. And Mark makes that point when he's covering the same period in, in um, Mark 13 about brother against brother. That's the text that he reserves to record the fall of the Western Empire. That is true. And it is brother against brother at that point because the brothers are against the brothers that are in the Eastern Empire and the brothers are against the brothers in the Western Empire and they aren't specifically brothers but they're related. That's why you need to understand, you know, turn this into a paradigm. Don't turn it into who's the specific ones because it's more about the trend of it than it is about who. Okay? So Zeno finally gets a little bit of peace by August in September because you know hello Italy's kind of far away from Byzantium in September Odovacher takes over now here's where it gets really interesting for our passage here which we're considering just this phrase right here which says and they will wonder all the inhabitants of the earth literally that's what that text says I'm not saying what they're wondering at you get that in the next couple of phrases but they will be they will be dumbstruck is a better phrase dumbstruck in amazement astonished all the inhabitants of the earth and it's real important that this phrase is used in order to understand that you first have to understand that there was a game of musical chairs which has just been resolved at the end of 476 or last quarter of it by Zeno consolidating his power at home in August and by Odovacher consolidating himself deposing Romulus Augustus in September. Now what's really amazing about that is that this next phrase you got two guys represented by Kai here who are newly enthroned as it were. Okay? And, and it's gonna work. We have to get into fiscal years with this because John is really being very coy here the way he's using the, the syllable counts. But you got two guys who are now Kai. You got Odovacher in the west, and you got Zeno in the east. And until that point, August, September, and of course in August the temple was taken down, so it's gonna have a lot of meaning to the Jewish reader. In September, which is the beginning of the, um, well, September, October, it depends on when the autumnal equinox occurs. The beginning of the, the regnal year, okay, the civil calendar. These guys are in power. New. Two Kais. Okay, Xenos technically came into power in 474, but he didn't consolidate it, and he actually got deposed in the middle and then he comes back so for all intents and purposes his solidified power takes place in 476 in August Odovacher September so now you got two rulers again but Odovacher abolished the office of Emperor Okay, that's what he did. So now we got, we got, oh boy, you know, Goth running 
Western Rome. And the question in Eastern Rome, which is, you know, what can they do about it? Eastern Rome is, well, do we assert control or not? And because Zeno was still having so much trouble with all the usurpers after him, promulgated by people in his own family, okay, um, then he kind of just lets it go. So on the one hand, no, you, the East didn't do anything to help the West, but on the other hand, well, hello, everybody's going through mu mu musical chairs, what can they do? All right, now here's where it gets really interesting and why this phrase is so apt. And we'll wonder all the inhabitants of the earth. Now when it says all the inhabitants of the earth, that was a catchphrase used by Romans, specifically Western Romans, but not only them. When the capital was moved to Byzantium, the, the new Rome people considered themselves all the inhabitants of the earth, too. Okay, but it's a catchphrase that you specifically buy Romans about Rome. In other words, if you're part of the Roman Empire, you count. If you're not part of the Roman Empire, you don't count. So when they said all the inhabitants, this is a word for inhabitants, katoi kuntes. Okay. When the arrogance of Rome, well, for the, all the inhabitants of the earth, okay, well that only means the Roman Empire. It doesn't really mean all the inhabitants of the earth. It is an arrogant assertion that the earth only consists of the Roman Empire anything outside the Roman Empire doesn't count alright so it's really clever given what's going to be said next here of those whose names are not written in the book of life okay of those not written names in the book of life is here Biblion des Zois and that gives rise to a whole other theological debate that I don't even want to discuss right now the point is is that the people who are deceived all the people who are deceived you'll notice the angel is very careful to, to not make the mistake of saying all the inhabitants of the earth and just leave it like that it's all the inhabitants of the earth who which makes them a subset of factually all the inhabitants on earth at that time. Okay? Whose names are not written. In other words, yeah, there are a whole bunch of people whose names who are living on the earth besides these people. But of the people living on the earth, all of them really, there's only a group who are going to wonder Okay, it, wonder is not a bad word. Be astonished, be amazed, be shocked. Okay? Now here's the kicker to this. Everybody was shocked at the time Rome fell. But they're so busy with their musical chairs in the West over Anthemius, who's going to take over and over, over Leo. And is it going to be Zeno or one of the other family people related to Leo who practiced a lot of marital alliances? Well, they're so busy fighting with each other, but that, but you know, when people are busy fighting with each other, and some third thing happens outside them, they get real sentimental. Oh, Rome fell. Oh, what are we going to do? And then they go back to fighting with each other. All the inhabitants of the earth are Roman. Oh, Rome, it fell. Oh, Rome, we got Eastern Rome much might fall because who should be the rightful ruler were headless, especially in Byzantine and Russian practice. The church is considered to not exist apart from the political ruler. That's a central tenet of Byzantine Christianity and now Russian Christianity. That's why this third Rome thing with Putin making love with Trump people is so bad. All right. Oh, we need a head. And then they get all romantic about their fight over which head they believe in. All the inhabitants of the earth will be shocked. Yeah, shocked that Eastern Rome, who they consider headless, 
shock the Western Rome, who's now headless, and everybody's trying to be the new head. Okay, it's that kind of shock. It's that the self-righteous. Oh, who's gonna? Who, oh, Rome fell. Who's gonna help her? And then everybody picks a side. 